Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our ISM New Jersey webinar series. We would like to welcome all of our ISM members, our chapter partners, because you make this event possible, and to all of our guests to today's program. Our speaker for today is Jay Tierney, who will be speaking on what the Ukrainian war might mean to your supply chain. What an important topic, Jane. So please be sure to ask any questions using our chat and Q&A function. And Jane will try to answer as best she can, because as you know, it is an active um, event going on in the world. We will be recording this presentation and we'll be sending the link later today with your CEH credit. Now on to the presentation and about our speaker. Jane founded her company Purple Link in 2015, sharing with clients their best way to obtain value through the supply chain. Clients find dollars leaking through their supply chains, draining the bottom line and uncover risks lurking in the supply chain that emerge at the worst possible time. And of course, Purple Link is there to assist you. Jane is an engineer with an MBA, green belt. She has a CPSM, CPSD certifications. In addition to running her business, she teaches operations and supply chain management courses in the California State University system and serves on the advisory board for the operations and supply chain management program at CSULB. In 2020, she co-founded the Southern California CSRM Council for Local Executives, focused on supply chain risk management, which hosts an annual supply chain risk symposium. Jane is a speaker and author, and she offers a bi-monthly dynamic dialogue webinar program, I'm sure most of the people on this call would be interested in, and conducts workshops on a variety of topics. Her first book is due out this year. I'm not sure if it's been published yet, but I did wanna mention that. So at this point, I'd like to turn the stage over to our speaker, Jane. Thanks, Kathy. And thanks to ISM New Jersey for the opportunity to, to share some insights today about what's going on with the Ukrainian war and how that might affect all of us thousands of miles away here in the United States. Um, everywhere you look, there's blast updates about this invasion of Ukraine, whether or not it's a war, but when I look at it, I don't know another word to call it except for a war. And a lot of people think, well, that's distant from us. We really don't have that much involvement, but I'm gonna talk about some of the companies that are involved with this and what's going on. And we're gonna look at why you might wanna reconsider that and pay a little bit more attention. So what we're gonna to do today is I'm gonna talk about the current state. I'm gonna spend um, a, a significant amount of time just looking at what's going on with the different companies doing business in the Russia and the Belarus areas. Talk to you about why this matters, give you a little insights about implications and effects that are what we're seeing now and then that we might see possibly in the future. And at the end, as always, I'm gonna give away some prizes. So if you wanna be part of the raffle, you need to send me an email right now to jane at purplelink.co. Maybe Kathy, you could put that into the chat and just put ISM for or webinar for the subject. You don't have to put anything else in the body of that and just send me an email. Then at the end, I'll do a little random number generation, pick a winner and give away some prizes. Uh, as a spoiling my own um, ending here, I do give away the slides, but I'll need an email in order to do that. So if you send me, if you participate in the raffle, you will also get a, copy of the slides from this presentation. And as you know, Kathy tapes it and it'll be available there too. So um, that's what we'll do and I'll give away prizes at the end. So we know that in mid-February, Russia invaded the Ukraine. And initially 36 countries, of course, including the United States and Canada, closed their airspace to the Russian, um, to Russian flights. Air shipments from China, Europe, or China to Eastern Europe, the US were affected. They were rerouted using alternate modes. Um, there's a rail uh, line that had been booming in 2021, uh, initially had frequent cancellations, and now most of it is almost suspended. Uh, this was a rail that was significant investment trying to connect uh, China with Europe, but it goes through parts of this area that are now affected by that. 
when this initially happened, there were some reports that came out that said over 2,100 U.S. companies and 1,200 EU firms had actually had tier one Russian suppliers. So that's at the beginning. That has changed, but uh, tier one suppliers are, are um, as we know, pretty important. And that's how many companies in the U.S. were dealing with that. Over 450 U.S. companies and 200 EU firms had tier one Ukrainian suppliers. So we're looking at a lot of companies, a lot of firms that were involved from the beginning. And then additionally, there were 190,000 US firms and 109,000 EU firms that had suppliers at the tier two to tier three level, either in Russia or Ukraine. So you may not think that this affects your supply chain, but maybe you're seeing that already that some of your tier two and tier three suppliers had links to the Ukraine and or Russia. Uh, 13 of those were, were software companies. The Ukraine, I found out in, back in the February, March timeframe that the Ukraine had been a very much hotbed of software engineering. So there were a lot of coders in that area and a lot of companies had contracted with that. In that same kind of line, 7% um, of those companies were doing business as customer service firms. Uh, a lot of those for support of the EU area due to time zones, but not necessarily. Trading and distribution were 6%, industrial machinery, 4%. And that's important, and we'll see that um, in a few other areas that why that's so important. So what we know about Russia and the Ukraine is that Russia was less than 2% of the global GDP and Ukraine was only 0.14%. So not really huge contributors to the global GDP. So another reason you say this doesn't affect me, it's not a very big deal. But again, the more you look at it, the more you understand it and the more digging I did into it, I said, wow, this has big long tentacles. Um, Russia provides 40% of Europe's natural gas and 65% of what Germany uses comes from Russia. Now they're making changes to that and as good fortune would have it, this activity wasn't started in the fall where Germany would need a lot of that natural gas to heat parts of the country to get bloody cold in the winter. I've spent a couple um, business trips in Germany in the winter and it can be really, really cold there. We all know that Russia is uh, a big oil exporter, third largest in the world, but only 7% of US imports ever came from Russia. Again, this is all pre the, the uh, invasion because this is, a, this is the baseline. So 7% of our imports came from Russia. That's been uh, really diminished now. I'm not sure if we're getting anything from that, but it was only 7%. But here's some other important areas and we're already starting to see implications in these areas. Russia and Ukraine combined um, com produced a third of the global wheat export. So that's important because a lot of that really went to third world countries and countries like Kazakhstan and Tanzania were importing up to 90% of their wheat from Russia. So since February, we have a lot of people, a lot of men in the Ukraine and a lot of soldiers from and men from Russia really involved in things other than food production. So when we think that a third of the wheat came comes from there up till now, it has come from there. I'm a farm girl from Missouri and I know that in the spring you better be planting. And there is no planting or very little planting going on either in the Ukraine or Russia this spring. So for one third of the wheat producers, but it combined, these countries are going to be severely impacted in their ability to produce that same level of wheat this year in the, in the calendar year 2022. So if there's no planting in the spring, there's no harvesting in the fall. And if there's no harvesting in the fall, then there's no turning of that wheat into flour over the next six months, year, at the end of this year, into next year. And so there's going to be a uh, an impact to that. We're starting to see that in third world countries, again, who got a lot of their wheat from uh, these countries. And 
Many people these days are gluten-free, but many people are not. And if you are not, then think about how much flour you consume in a day. I did a, a, a in-person speaking activity in the last couple of days. And at the back of the room, they had fruit bowls and they had muffins and rolls and things like that. And I said, all of that, you know, takes wheat to make it. So if we don't have the wheat or wheat at the same level, then it's going to do things like increase the price and limit the availability. Uh, we, we can produce a lot of wheat here in the United States, but and we could probably make up for that, but we can't make up for that in this first year because farmers weren't prepared to do that. So there's some implications there. A um, couple other things that I found interesting is if we don't have enough problems with semiconductors already, 90% of semiconductor grade neon that's used in the United States comes from the Ukraine. So we're already scrambling trying to produce enough semiconductors around the globe and this neon gas that is important comes from the Ukraine. Again, how many of these Ukrainian companies are able to keep their manufacturing intact, produce at the levels that they've been producing the last few years? It's becoming a moving number of cities that are involved with these skirmishes and versus being totally wiped out in some cases. So we have problems now, we're gonna have continued problems from things like that. Russia produces um, over 33% of the palladium used in the United States. Again, a semiconductor component. We have problems with semiconductors already. We're gonna continue to have those. And then Russia has been a dominant exporter of nickel and titanium, which includes titanium forgings for many, many years. And that is now um, at risk, suspended, changed. Their ability to do that is not as great and the uh, appetite for the Russian products is being diminished. It doesn't mean the appetite for those products is being diminished. In some cases, it's being increased, but by wanting to buy from Russia is not nearly as palatable as it was uh, in January of this year. So these are some companies that have cut ties with Russia. And these were some of the initial companies that announced things that they were doing. So I'm not gonna go through all of these, but I'm gonna pick out a few of those. Um, GM was suspending external products. They sell about 3000 cars a year there, but they also sell spare parts and maintenance and things like that. About 10 automakers suspended their business in Russia initially. Some shut the factories indefinitely. And what I'm finding is a lot of companies have suspended activity, which means they're leaving the door open to per, perchance perhaps be able to go back and reignite that commerce at some point in time. Others have just exited and said, we're done, we're out, we're not coming back. Um, there's a lot of different things going on. Dell, which produces a lot of computers, is not selling products uh, into Russia, and they weren't selling products into the Ukraine either. That might have changed recently, but I wasn't able to confirm that. Um, Harley-Davidson motorcycles, uh, not exporting those any longer. Meta, which is Facebook, was blocking Facebook ads both, with both the Ukraine and Russia. They have taken some additional activities now. Um, Uber really had a, a joint, kind of a joint venture with Yannex, uh, uh, Yannex Taxi, and they're diversing that. Diversing, divesting themselves, I'm sorry, um, from that. And they've recently sped that up. They're really trying to get out of there more quickly than ever. Philip Morris suspended planned investments and has reduced their manufacturing. So Philip Morris is a big producer of things like cigarettes. And so that's uh, uh, affecting the, the Russian population. Nike has closed their Russian stores maybe temporarily, maybe forever. Again, they're leaving the door open, but in very quickly in March, they closed those stores. Um, Unilever, who produces Dove and Sunsilk brands, a lot of soap and, and self-care products, they've suspended their imports and their exports. American Express uh, immediately suspended ops in Russia and Belarus, and that's still in place. Goldman Sachs, which was the first large bank to really exit 
already reported about a $300 million loss in Q1 and Q2 is to be determined. So you're going to see a theme in some of these, but I think it's important to kind of reinforce that. There are companies who are saying that we're continuing business, but only on an essential basis. Uh, among those is IKEA, who has suspended both imports and exports, but has remained open in certain major shopping centers because they've say, said they want to ensure customers have access to essential products. So for the time being, that's what they're doing with these major shopping center stores being open with essential items. Nestle has suspended a lot of their sales. Um, coffee, Nestle makes lots and lots of things. They make pet food, they make coffee, they make candies like Kit Kat, and they make things like Nesquik. So they make a lot of those things. They've halted all imports and exports, all the advertising and all investments into that company. At first, they just suspended some things. They were continuing to sell like pet food, which they said is an essential type thing. They are still providing like powdered milk and some milk products and other food essentials. They've, they've continued that part of the business, but things like the candy that they initially were continuing, they are now suspending all of that or stopping that. In um, terms of energy, BP, British Petroleum, wrote off uh, $25.5 billion for investments and work they were doing in Russia. The, one of the write-ups says it's only a paper loss, but still a paper loss is something that investors look at and that the company looks at overall. They are also selling off their 20% stake in Rosneft, which is a energy company in Russia. Exxon has ended their oil and natural gas projects that were going on there. Shell is exiting a joint venture um, with, of natural gas, and they expected a four to five billion dollar cost hit, hit in Q1. So we all know we're paying incredible prices at the pump. There's a reason for that, and it's not just the incredible profits they're reporting. It's trying to offset some of these activities. Um, food, and I'll talk some more about some different food companies, but um, Mondelez International, who makes things like Oreos, Ritz crackers, Cadbury candies, they um, are only sending essentials into to Russia because I guess all of us consider Oreos an essential part. Uh, I'm not sure what they're doing now, but that's initially what they did is they, they reduced their numbers of products that they were producing there. And um, we'll continue to, to lower that in, in as far as the, the um, activity I've seen. So here's some companies that initially didn't really cut ties, but now they're changing that. So we've been doing this since February, March timeframe, and it's now the middle of June. So we've had from February to June about four months of seeing what's going on in the Ukraine. And here's what companies are doing in response. Carlsberg, which is the third largest brewer in the world, initially just halted their investments. Now they're fully divesting themselves of the Russian and Belarus businesses. And they're thinking that's gonna be about a $1.4 billion charge off. Um, Heineken initially halted their manufacturing, their ads, their sales. Now they too are exiting complete. Mars, which makes M&Ms, but they also make products like Whiskas and Pedigree, which are pet foods, initially suspended advertising. Now they're suspending all new investments and they're focusing on their, their like their pet foods, their essential type products for um, people that live in Russia. Pepsi has stopped all soda sales. They didn't, at first they just reduced some of those. Now they've stopped the sales of soda in completely, but they are producing dairy and baby food things. Uh, Starbucks initially paused all operations in their 130 stores that cover about 2000 employees. Now they're closing all the stores which are owned and operated by a Kuwaiti firm. So Starbucks has actually been doing business there through this Kuwaiti firm. Now they've said they're going to uh, closing. They're going to close all those stores. Mastercard initially blocked financial tra transactions um, within Russia or from Russia to other countries. Now they're preventing cards that are issued from Russian banks 
from working in other countries and they're blocking cards that are issued from other countries from working inside Russia. So they're kind of doing a dual duty there. They're making sure that only Russian banks that have issued cards to people inside Russia can use those cards. Um, they're not allowing cards from other countries to be used inside Russia and they're not allowing cards issued to some of maybe the oligarchs and some other people from Russian banks they're not allowing those to be used in other countries. McDonald's has been in the news a little bit about that. They initially closed um, the stores, but continued paying their employees. Now these stores have been taken over by a Russian licensee that's basically offering the same fare with the exception of a Big Mac. Uh, McDonald's is expecting an almost $1.5 billion, billion dollar write-off. Burger King, which is Restaurant Brands International, is ending their corporate support for their 800 locations in Russia. And they've stopped all investment or expansion plans. And Yum Brands, which is 70 KFC stores and 50 franchise-owned pizza huts, they're also discontinuing. So there's a lot of things going on with all of these companies. So you'll see what one does, often their competition is following suit pretty rapidly. There's some other companies that were not initially cutting ties. Uh, Disney at first halted release of the Batman movie, which seems like when I look at what the movies that are out there now with Top Gun and Jurassic Park and some other ones, the Batman seems like a vague memory. And I still haven't seen it by the way. But now Disney is not just halting release of films. They're pausing all business operation. And again, you'll see me use this word pausing, suspending. These companies are deliberately using those words because they are not closing. Other times, if companies have announced an exit or a full closure, then those are the words that I'm going to use because that's the words they're using. Uh, Citigroup, which initially said they were going to assess their operations in Russia, now has expanded the scope of their exit. They employ 3,000 people there, and they've set aside almost $2 billion for a potential loss from that exit. Bloomberg uh, has continued operations, but recently in um, May, I believe, they pulled all their journalists from, from Russia and they've cut off Russian and Belarus from all of their products, which is all of their media platforms, including all the trading platforms that Bloomberg has. So that you might say, okay, they cut off the news, but one thing is they did protect their journalists because we're seeing some journalists being arrested and being um, cited for certain things in these different countries, but they've also cut off the trading platform that Bloomberg has. So that's a, a, a penalty to both Bloomberg and its customers. Netflix uh, suspended service initially, but now they've halted all their future projects that include Russia. Intel, again, our chip shortages, right? Initially stopped their shipments to Russia and Belarus. Now they've suspended all Russian operations. Uh, I wish I could say that's going to make a ton more semiconductors available to the rest of the world, but I don't really know that. I hope that that has some effect and is a penalty to Russia as well as to other companies which are desperately looking for some of these parts. Um, I'm going to pause because it says my internet is unstable, so hopefully it's back. Intel um, initially stopped their, I already said this, Nokia suspended new business, now they're leaving. And they've set aside $109 million for Q2 to help them get out of there. Caterpillar, who makes big um, farm equipment and digging equipment, recently paused all their manufacturing in Russia, where initially they were continuing to do business. Coke Industries, another business, that initially said, no, we're gonna continue business as usual. Um, Coke Industries, if you're not familiar, is the second largest private employer in the United States with about 115 annual dollars in revenue, uh, $115 billion in revenue. Now they're 
asking their, their subsidiaries, one of which is Guardian, um, one of the largest glass manufacturers in the world that's located in Russia, they're asking them to craft an escape route or an exit strategy that will include and cover the safety of its roughly 600 employees. Russian authorities have been warning that such moves from companies can lead to prosecution and, and imprisonment of people. And so to prevent that, Coke Industries is looking for an exit strategy that is gonna help um, their employees and hopefully prevent penalties there to their employees from certain uh, activities that the company does. There's a, a, tech companies are making a lot of moves as well. Amazon Web Services stopped accepting new customers there and they're assessing what they're gonna do in addition to that. Apple paused sales in, into Russia in March and they have removed two Russia, Russian media platforms from their Apple store and they've stopped exports into Russia. So they're hitting that on a few different areas. They've stopped their, their uh, exports and their sales, but they're also removing these platforms from the Apple store so that making that um, propaganda, if, it, if you, if I can use that word, not available through the Apple Store. So they're they're taking actions to to ensure freedom of speech, but also supporting sanctions. Uh, Cogen has cut off what's considered a backbone internet access, so that is hurting different parts of the of the country in Russia. Ericsson is is, is suspending their business. They've got employees on paid leave, which some of these companies have been able to do and they still estimate a $95 million hit to their financials. So again, they're suspending their business. They're trying to keep paying their employees because many of these companies do have a little bit of a heart and they are trying to protect employees where they can, but they're estimating a big hit to their financials. Google has suspended advertising on their search engine and their YouTube channels and YouTube uh, has blocked channels associated with any state-funded Russian media. IBM suspended business indefinitely. Sony initially just suspended Russian operations. Now they've suspended all the software and hardware shipments, including PlayStation stores um, products into and out of Russia. So they're closing those doors as well. For travel, we'll see a lot of different activities there. Airbus uh, pretty quickly suspended supplies of parts, maintenance, and tech services. So that means all the Airbus airplanes that are operated in Russia, and all, most of these include Russia and Belarus. Um, they're not getting spare parts for planes. They're not getting the maintenance and technical services that they were before for working on and maintaining planes. American and other commercial airlines pretty much suspended Russian, Russian travel very early on. United went a bit further and suspended certain flights over Russian airspace that include flights between San Francisco and Delhi and Newark to Mumbai because those flights had routes over Russian airspace and they did not want to do that. They did not want to take that risk. Um, and so they have suspended those flights indefinitely. You can still get to Delhi, you just have to go not from San Francisco. Boeing, um, a big uh, manufacturer, a big uh, user of products like titanium, think titanium and all the aerospace applications, they've stopped buying any titanium from Russia. So there's other companies that are following along and Boeing themselves had a lot of um, contracts in that space. Some of their suppliers may still be getting titanium from Russia, but they're looking at how they can shut that down and divert that. But titanium is one of those metals, and we'll look at a couple of these, that is not readily available in lots of other countries. So it's not like we have a big store of titanium here, or we have uh, ore where we can go mine titanium. It's, it's not found in very many places in the globe. Hyatt has suspended all development work in Russia. Hilton has closed their corporate office that was located in Moscow. And then DHL, big, big freight um, mover, suspended all inbound services to Russia and Belarus. 
and UPS has halted all their delivery services to and from Russia. So a lot of activity going on here um, prior to this invasion that is now being either shut down, changed, halted, rerouted, lots of different things. And, and what this all means is it's really complicated. It, there's so many different ends of this. It, the, it has implications financially because companies have time and money invested in Russian locales. They've been doing business and working to set up businesses um, you know, I talked about a couple different companies having 300 sites or 70 um, KFCs. That doesn't happen overnight. And KFC is one of the first companies that went into that. Uh, the McDonald's stores have been put there over a period of years. They've done a lot of training. They've done a lot of investment. They've set up factories, trained factories. Um, Hilton, as we just saw, had a whole headquarters uh, in Moscow. Um, their corporate headquarters for the, that region. Now, all of that's changing. So all of the time, all of the money that these companies have invested in these Russian locales are now being upended. Many companies are taking to heart their employee obligations. They're, the fact that shutting these places down, even suspending them for several months, can put people severely at risk. Um, many people can go without a paycheck for a week or two, but for month after month, it, it becomes untenable for many, many people across the globe. So they, some companies have continued to pay their employees. Some companies have um, reduced payments to them or have helped them try to find other employment, but there are employee obligations there. And some of these are American citizens. So there are some expats that have been living there, working there, doing different activities for so certain periods of time, and they're trying to protect their employees as well. They also have contractual obligations. So they have con contracts with customers, contracts with suppliers. Many of those in Russia are um, have links and ties to the Russian government. So if you have these contractual obligations, it's not as easy just to walk away from those. Sometimes there are penalties, sometimes there are um, severe impact to the company and potential for them coming back can be affected as well. Because one of the things that the Koch brothers indicated when they said they uh, were discontinuing their operations there or putting things on pause is that they're, they're, they worry about the Russian seizure of their assets which could not only be a terrible impact to the company itself, but it also could be a boon to the Russian government and the Russian um, efforts to continue the war in Ukraine, which is what we're trying not to support. So ethical issues, again, employee well-being. It's not only the financial piece, which is considerable, but Russia has, again, threatened to prosecute and jail people, fine people significantly for certain activities. So Russia is taking serious actions against people, their own people in this area. So if you work for a company that's shutting down, Russia might have laws or be creating laws that are now gonna hold you responsible for that and you can be subject to prosecution in Russia. And I don't know about you, but all the stories I've read about going to jail in Russia is, man, I don't want that. And I don't want anybody else going through that. And also companies are considering their place as a global citizen, corporate citizenship in this global playing field. So the ethical issues there are if you continue to support and do business in Russia, what is that going to do to your customers outside of that area? Many, many countries in the Americas, in, um, in Europe, and even in Asia and Austria, uh, Australia and New Zealand are looking at this and saying, people, consumers are saying, I'm going to make my decisions about what I buy from who, based in part on how they're treating this situation. So companies don't want to get um, black eyes from their customers and potential customers by not being 
an ethical player in this whole thing. And the ethics gets very tricky because you're trying to take care of your business, you're trying to take care of people, and you're trying to take care of the future of both of those. So there's a lot of issues there. And then many stakeholder impacts, uh, customer loyalty, which is one of the things, the financial expectations of publicly traded companies. So many people here, these are brands and these are products that, that I use and I'm sure that many of you find familiar. Some of you have pets and you buy products for pet foods that come from these companies. You buy these products that are on your shelves from companies like Kimberly Clark and um, Oreos and many other companies, the breweries I talked about, the travel that you do, all of these things are not just located in one country and the stakeholders are global. There are short-term implications and there are long-term implications and stakeholders are, weigh are weighing these and we're all seeing how this is gonna play out because there's a lot of challenges in this. So let's look at a couple of these areas, these co the commodities in a little detail. Automobiles, um, we all know we've seen incredibly increased gas prices um, and that's driving some interest in fuel efficient vehicles, but those are expensive. And if you're looking at the price as being increased, then maybe that doesn't make that as attractive. Um, again, there's lots of reasons for that. Um, and we see these companies that are publicly traded now uh, posting record profits, which um, I can't understand why they don't uh, bite that bullet a little bit, but there's um, states and, and localities uh, considering suspending state and um, other gas taxes for some period of time. There was some activity in Congress about these windfall profits that didn't seem to go anywhere, but that might get resurrected again, um, even though it was just talked about in the last few months. Um, there's been a boom in SUV and truck sales that um, led the auto manufacturers to decrease and discontinue their fuel efficient production levels. So companies like Toyota and GM and Ford and Honda and, and all of the other companies are really trying to figure out what do people want? Do they want fuel efficiency? Do they want these bigger things? It's been hard to figure out. Um, and they haven't done a good job in projecting. And that was one of the contributors. And it still is one of the contributors to why we have issues with semiconductors, because the co car companies made some errors in forecast, significant errors in the 2020, late 2020 kind of time frame going into 2021 that caused some of these issues that we still haven't been able to recover from. So there's challenges there. Um, Auto execs seem to be really bullish on these electric vehicles, but the inventory is scarce and the availability of recharging stations is still not where it needs to be. And many, many cities, states, counties um, are gonna have to make significant investments in recharging stations to make those uh, readily available and make and encourage people uh, to actually make that investment in non-fuel vehicles. Um, again, there's an added impact to the chip shortages. We've seen reports that auto manufacturers are shipping their cars without all the um, chips in them saying, you know, here's this, but guess what? Your, um, your PlayStations and your DVR doesn't work, doesn't DVD player doesn't work in the back yet. When we get the chips, we'll give you notification. You can go into your dealer and they'll install those chips for free. That includes things like entertainment, um, infotainment, they call it. And they also, um, things like rear controls for, um, for heat and for air conditioning and things like that. They're still working and they can still be controlled from the front, but the rear controls are being suspended. So they're looking for parts that they cannot put in these cars right now because they don't have enough chips to make everything work. And the spare parts for automobiles is a potentially really big issue in Russia. Um, I told you that GM was selling about 3000 cars into Russia, but more and more cars were being sold from uh, manufacturers across the globe. And if these companies band together and don't 
send more repair parts into Russia and aren't producing those parts there, then that can have an effect on the Russian economy. So lots of things going on there. Energy and fuel impact, again, not much of our oil, 7% came from Russia in 2021. They're working to find other um, sources of that. So it's not a Russian oil sole reason for the pricing of gas. Um, Saudi Arabia is being enlisted to do that, but the price of oil has gone up and it's come down per barrel. So it's equivalent in some cases to what it was. I've seen several different things um, where they're comparing the price 10 years ago of oil to, to what it is now, but the price of gas is like $2 different. So I don't know. I don't understand all this. And if economists do, then they're way ahead of me. Um, Europe does have nuclear reactors and those can help supply power. And they've been looking for ways to do that. But if you remember one of the largest uh, nuclear reactors in Europe is in the Ukraine. And Russia has had control of that for a while. So there's some issues there. Um, you know, we've got high gas prices. We're going into the summer, which is trip typically vacation time. People want to fly. They want to drive. They want to do things. We've got a little bit of lift in this pandemic. So um, there are still places that are uh, mask mandated and those kinds of things. And uh, people are still cautious, but we, we have probably more freedom than we've had in almost two and a half years. And yet people are reluctant to go places now because of the prices of gas. Um, and so there's a lot of different things going on here. The global food, this is, a, a, this is an issue that I think is just gonna get bigger. Um, fertilizer, food supply chains start with growing crops. and and that requires fertilizer. Raw material prices for fertilizers were up as high as 30% from the beginning of 2022. Prices for nitrogen are four times higher, um, as much as four times higher and more versus two years ago. And things like potash and phosphate are higher as well, three times or more. So you might not understand what nitrogen is used for potash and phosphate, but those all go into fertilizers. Developing countries have been able to offset a lot of the price increases through higher prices on crops, which now translates to higher prices on food. And the inflation and the availability is putting everybody at risk. So a lot of food, as we know, is grown in the United States, but a lot of it is not. And we've all been able to partake in, some, in things like strawberries year round, fresh strawberries at the store, because we import them from different parts of the globe. These developing countries have been able to create good revenue streams and increase their, their um, economies by growing these different products. But now with higher prices on fertilizer, which a lot of this stuff comes from the Russia and um, Belarus area and Ukraine. And don't forget that these materials, these potash, nitrogen, phosphate are also used in weapons. Uh, if you think about that Oklahoma City bombing, that was done with fertilizer. That, so this material can be used for good and it can be used not so good. So there's a lot of different things going on here. Ukraine has been a major supplier of not only wheat, but corn and barley. And uh, so that is going to be an effect too in the next year or two, because it's going to take them some time. Even if this stopped tomorrow, it's going to take them the devastation and the, the damage that's been done is going to take time for them to recover from. Production from other countries can help, but not as quickly as we would like. You know, the growing cycle of these things is, is what it is. It takes a long time. Um, U.S. and Canada can increase wheat and corn production. I don't know that they can do it this year as fast as they would like. And we have things like sunflower oil production that is used in potato chips and a lot of other processed foods, and that's going up. So it, it's these effects are coming from a lot of different places. Metals like nickel, um, nickel prices went up 66% on March 7th, 66%. It's up and down from there, but it's crazy. Um, Australian company plan to buy uh, this Western Areas Limited for $800 million. Uh, they had a price rally. It caused it to, do, uh, to 
the valuation to change. Now it was supposed to complete in April. Now it was forecast for this May, June timeframe. I don't think it's going through this month either. I think that's getting pushed out. So there's a lot of different things happening. So businesses that had plans to do X now are reevaluating. Other metal markets, uh, I already talked about titanium, but palladium, 40% of the palladium um, used in car electronic production has come from Russia. So again, if we want electronics in cars, we need all of these things. Copper um, is, is large reserves of copper in Russia. Copper is available in other parts of the world, including here in the United States, but there are other things like platinum that have not so many alternatives. And we already talked about titanium. So um, for IT kinds of things, there's a, a lot of, of challenges there. Um, Maersk's IT infrastructure was affected by this attack on a Ukrainian tax software that cost the company about $7.3 billion. Maersk has also uh, suspended um, routing uh, boats into and out of Russia. So that's another big change. There's th more variants and software viruses that are looking that are lurking out there. Elon Musk are very early on sent these starlight, starlight satellite dishes to Ukraine. Um, he delivered those. There were some tweets. If you remember this story, I love this story because um, they said they needed help and Elon sent things and two weeks later they were receiving these and they were working very well, but they need more. Uh, they need more of everything because the longer this goes on, the more help they need with infrastructure, weapons, and, and just food and clean water. So providers for logistics, um, there's been 20 plus percent increase in delays of uh, less than truckloads into Eastern Europe, which is again, another manufacturing hub. They're looking at dwell times. We're looking at ocean freight rates and we're looking at rail rates and truck rates, rates and truckers. Um, ocean freights have been up to as much as 40 times what they were a year or two years ago. Not twice, not three times, but 10, 20, 40 times. Um, European consumers, goods and packaged food, up as much as 55%. And a lot of different things were tankers, carriers had to be rerouted after this Russian invasion and starting here and then changing and then more of that. So a lot of reroutes has been con causing confusion at ports and congestion and really making a mess of things. The Russian response really has been to threaten to nationalize assets of Western companies. So I said before, why do companies not just put sanctions in there because Russia is threatening to nationalize those assets, which is really confiscate. Come in and take those and take over those and say, now they're ours. Um, that could hurt jobs there. It could, um, th they want to try to maintain the ability to produce some goods domestically, but that puts a lot of workers in limbos. A lot of, a lot of people in the Russian country work for a lot of these companies. Uh, companies that are not Russian based and they're not just US based either they're all over the place and they're passing laws for speech and protests against the war they're they're instituting fines they're rounding up lots of people they've jailed western citizens and arrested them with what seems like bogus charges in some cases and um, their their news outlets are receiving more scrutiny some people there are speaking up, and when they do, there, there are penalties, and some people are disappearing, as happens in Russia. So this is not good stuff. So there's, a, there's financial implications. Companies have had to alter their financial projections. It costs money to exit from Russia. None of that was budgeted. And when they put their budgets together at the end of 2021, the worst thing they were thinking about is, what's COVID going to do? Are we going to have another... A Delta or Omicron or whatever, nobody really planned that I know of big companies for what happens if Russia invades the Ukraine. So all of this is upending that. Projections were based on business as usual for the Russia and Ukraine, meaning all of the things that you get from there would still continue to be available in pretty much the same kinds of prices. And we could sell into there as well. And so not only that, but there's still 
factoring in COVID issues, some places are experiencing significant um, swells in COVID infections, and there's still a lot of consternation about how to deal with that. Political influences, heaven knows we are going crazy with political influences here, and that doesn't count what's going on in the rest of the world. So there's a lot of issues there. Companies are looking to balance their books. So they're changing up. Now we're in the sec, they're looking at the second half of 2022. They're trying to find revenue that's going to offset the closed sales channels that they've experienced from the first half of the year, either through um, the Ukrainian war, the Russian access, and the uh, COVID impacts. And they're trying to find revenue to offset their increased expenses from all these activities in suspending things in Russia. Um, continuing to pay workers there with, with getting no revenue. So they're trying to figure out how they can be a viable business. And then, then we have inflation. Then you say, why do we have inflation? Well, there's a lot of reasons, not least of which is this activity that's affecting all these companies. And these, effect, and these companies are trying to balance their own books with what they can do. So these situations are changing daily and weekly. The impacts are very far reaching. The, the longer it continues, unfortunately, the more we learn about it, but we still don't know what's gonna happen politically, economically, ethically. There's a lot of issues. And almost everyone was totally unprepared for this kind of risk. We keep talking about risk in supply chains, but I don't know how we prefer we prepare for every scenario. So it's more important that you focus on the basics and try to do what you can to manage the risks you can identify, look to make your supply chains flexible, um, responsive, agile. And with this wait and see mode, companies are getting off of that wait and see mode and taking actions at least initially, but you don't know what's gonna happen next. So, Usually I have a, a slide here that talks about a better way, but what I found, and ironically, I, this article was released today. Here's, um, here's what's happening with these companies. So you get a sense of how much is involved. There, initially, after the Ukraine invasion in like the first part of March, there were a few dozen companies taking action. Now there's over a thousand companies that have completely curtailed operation in Russia. And these are not U.S. companies. These are all over the world. But many of these companies that are not U.S. companies are still familiar to you. I have not had time to put all this together, um, but I will do that. And that's what's going to be my dynamic dialogue next week. So if you want that, I'll give you the link to that. Just so you can see, some companies business as usual, some are delaying investment and development, some are reducing their operations, a lot are keeping their options open, and some are, are trying to break clean. So it's a myriad of things across the globe from these companies. So this is something that we're going to continue to see. There's a lot of challenges here. Um, what I do with Purple Link is to offer companies ways to look to make your supply chains more resilient, more agile, find the cost, um, and go on. So if you would like to talk more about this, you can set up a free call with me at callwithjane.com, and we can talk about this or other activities. I do online workshops. I'm doing a CPSM class, so if you're interested in getting your CPSM certification, I'm starting a class in July for exam one. We're looking at risk-based thinking and decision-making. Again, along these lines, how do you identify the risk? How do you quantify it? And then trying to make your supply chains more robust with lean and Six Sigma techniques. A lot of lean, a little bit of Six Sigma so that you can implement these things quickly. I'm doing those um, at the in Q3 of this year. So a lot of activities going on. Um, now, if you would like to, I'm going to give away the prizes. So I'm going to give you about one more minute to send me an email to jane at purplelink.co. No M on that. And then um, just put ISM or webinar or something in the subject line. And I'm going to count how many people did this. I'm going to take a quick look at the questions. Um, so yes, I will give you the slides if you send me an email. So you need to send me an email for that. Um, Kathy will share the recording. Um, we do have a question from George. Uh, okay. roughly what percentage of Ukraine's economy is still operating? You know, that is a great question, George, and I do not have an answer, but I can get you that answer. 
Thank you. <laughs> so why don't you send me an, an email with that question in it and I will get that for you. So I know. Oh, def definitely, definitely. And Kathy, I think there's one for you about the certificates. Yes, yes. And what I'll do is I'll uh, contact you directly. And uh, but just so everybody knows, we do send all of our certificates and a copy of the recording. We use our constant contacts. So please make sure that, um, you know, you allow that email address to come through that um, that platform to come through to your um, email. If you, for some reason, you're not getting um, a copy of the certificate, contact me directly and I will make sure to uh, make sure you get it, but no worries. Okay, if anybody else has any other questions. I'm pulling up the lucky number now. Okay, great. Okay, let's see who the winner is. It's Nicholas Tanzet. Tenzetic? I'm not so sure I said that right, Nicholas. I'm sorry. Are you still here? Because you need to be here for me to to um, to win. Okay, perfect. So um, I will send you that. It's going to be a $25 gift card. I'll make sure I've got a good email for that. I'll send everybody who sent me, um, gave me their email. I'll send you the slides and I'll sign you up for the subscription as well. So I want to leave you with one a um, couple of things, because I've become a very big fan of Vladimir Zelensky. And I first uh, was enthralled when I saw him that President Biden offered to send in um, access for him to exit the country so that he could remain safe, he and his family. And his response was, the fight is here. I need ammunition, not a ride. And so I thought that was incredible, incredibly brave. And that was just one of his first things. The other told the other thing he told the Russians is, if you come in, it will be our faces you see, not our backs. So we are going to fight until the end. And he is saying, um, I'm not iconic. Ukraine is iconic. And the more I learn about the country of Ukraine and the history, it's really pretty incredible. And I have a lot of respect for all of those people. I have a lot of sympathy for, I can't even imagine what it's like to wake up one day and find that someone has invaded your country um, with all of the things that were going on there and all of the activity and all of the commerce that has been going on there for decades. So I, I think this is an important time for all of us. I think they need our thoughts and prayers and help in a lot of ways, but I am uh, very much impressed with this guy. And as if you don't know, he was an actor and a comic and uh, thought by a lot of people not to be very serious, but I think he's proven that he's a very serious uh, man and he's very serious about his mission with Ukraine. So thank you very much, Kathy and ISM New Jersey for this opportunity. Um, I will take other questions if you have them. And if not, then um, I'll let you return back to your day. I do have one question. Given the migration of U.S. business due to the Ukraine-Russian conflict, what impact on terms of opportunities might that have on staffing businesses? And she um, also wants to know about your new book. Well, my book is coming way slower than I would like. So um, I'm gonna work on that. It's, the book is on supplier management and some techniques to try to get some um, better ways to work with suppliers. And it also applies to customers as well. So um, the, um, I forget the first part of the question, I'm sorry. Given the migration of US business due to the Ukraine-Russian conflict, what impact of terms of opportunities might that have on the staffing businesses? Well, I think these companies are not gonna just bring everything home, whether again, home is the US or Germany or wherever the companies are located. They, they want to be global companies. They're gonna be looking for other sites. Um, it, I, I think it, it does create opportunities in other parts of the world and, and it creates opportunities in um, parts close to Russia and Ukraine. It might 
end up being a very good boon to Ukraine if they can get this settled and, and get, um, you know, stop the, the, the activity, stop the firing and, and the, the decimating of cities, et cetera. But for Eastern Europe, there's a lot of potential there. The EU is, some, is taking action and some other countries in the EU, um, Finland, Sweden, which you know, have been historically reluctant to talk about joining the EU now are looking to do that. So I think there is a lot of opportunity for other countries. And I think there's a lot of opportunities for these co um, companies to find other places to do business, to rethink their strategies and to try to come out with things that are gonna be better um, in the short and midterm, as well as the long term for their businesses. But it's a pivot that nobody expected to take. And it's going to take some time to be able to make that pivot. And hopefully they will do it thoughtfully and deliberately and not knee jerk, which sometimes companies do too much of. And then they, they take an action. And then three years later, they say, gosh, you know, this might not have been the right thing, but now we're stuck here. And so how do we deal with this? Thank you. Um, Miriam, I see that you have a hand up, but I'm not sure if you have a question for Jane or not. If you want to put something in the chat, if, if you want to ask your question live, you can let us know that too. Oh, okay. I don't know, Miriam, are you on mute? No, um, I think she signed off, so I think we're done. <laughs> she shows still there, so okay. Yes, yeah, she does? Okay. She hasn't uh, sent. She hasn't uh, put anything in. Um, okay. You have my okay. email. You're welcome to reach out. Yes, definitely. If anybody has any additional questions, please make sure. I will be said. As I said, I'll be sending out an email a little later today. If you have any questions for Jane, please respond back to me, and then I can forward it over to Jane, and then she can respond accordingly to your question. Okay. And I wanted. Thank you again for, um, for joining us today. And thank you, Jane, for bringing this important topic to our ISM community. And all, as always, thanks for the opportunity to meet with your members. Thank Have you so much. Have a great so day, much. everyone. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day.